So our mission is to bring to market cellular medicines to treat serious and life-threatening diseases. We differentiate ourselves from other regenerative medicines by primarily focusing on three main attributes, the underlying cellular technology, the ability to commercially execute, and to develop a robust pipeline that has multiple shots on goal. I'll talk a little bit more about the underlying technology shortly, but suffice to say that we believe we are working with the most potent type of adult stem cell of mesenchymal lineage. This has extensive IP protection, and we have a, a real good understanding of mechanistically how these cells work. We're working with Lons as our contract manufacturer, so this enables us to ensure that we're able to meet our commercial supply forecasts, and we have an experienced reimbursement and regulatory team. And also through our partnership with JCR Pharmaceuticals in Japan, they have market approval now for graft host disease in both pediatric and adult patients. So we have an experience now of what it takes to have commercial expertise. And finally, we have multiple programs in phase three, and I think this is important from an investor perspective because it allows for continuous news flow. I think the audience here is pretty familiar with the 21st Century Cures Act, which has specific clauses for regenerative medicine that allows for the potential of accelerated approval pathways if you're targeting serious or life-threatening diseases with unmet medical needs. We believe, in fact, that all of our advanced programs will meet this designation, and we're in the process now of seeking RMAT designations. So I alluded about our IP. We have uh, extensive IP with over 800 patents that cover composition of matter, methods of manufacturing, and indication-specific enablement, claims well out to 2035 in multiple countries. So we believe we really dominate this IP landscape for mesenchymal lineage cells. Primarily, we are isolating our cells through positive immunoselection, uh, isolating what we believe are the most potent type of mesenchymal lineage cells. These cells are pretty rare, representing maybe one in 100,000 cells in the bone marrow. They're allogeneic. Mechanistically, the way they work is they have receptors for different injury signals, and then they respond accordingly by secreting paracrine factors that tackle the disease from multiple mechanisms of action. But unlike small molecules and biologics, the sicker the patient, the more injury signals, the more advanced the disease, the better our cells respond. As I said before, we're working with Lons as our contract manufacturer, predominantly out of their Singapore facility. This is a picture of it. We believe the current infrastructure should support the first three years of commercial launch activities, and you can see clearly in Singapore they have the ability to continue to build it out. And we're also working with Lons for further optimization of the manufacturing process, including serum-free media and 3D bioreactor technologies. This is a snapshot of our portfolio. At first glance, it may look somewhat eclectic. Phase three programs in heart failure, chronic lower back pain, graft versus disease, as well as a number of phase two programs in uh, inflammatory disorders such as diabetic nephropathy and biologic refractory RA. But they're all underpinned by common mechanisms of actions that include anti-inflammation and immune modulation. I'll focus primarily just on our three lead phase three programs, starting with heart failure. This is the uh, continuum of heart disease. You have a heart failure hospitalization, then another event, then another hospitalization, then ultimately it's a downward spiral. You'll either die, get a heart transplant, of which there's less than 2,000 of them annually in the United States, or get a left ventricular cyst device, essentially a mechanical heart. So the prognosis is very poor, especially in class four heart failure patients. There's approximately 250 to 300,000 of these patients. Uh, annual mortality rate is 50%, so it's really like a cancer-like outcome. Uh, when you get a left ventricular assist device, of which there's less than 5,000 of these done worldwide, the mortality improves, but still 20 to 30% annual mortality rate, and it has a very high incidence of hospitalization for GI bleeding and other complications. So we hypothesize that if we could improve mortality, if we could reduce GI bleeding and other complications, that the use of these LVAD devices could improve. Furthermore, if we can improve the heart function, perhaps we could even remove these mechanical cyst devices after they're implanted. So the NIH in the US sponsored an initial 30 patient randomized controlled study, 20 treated, 10 controls. Uh, at the time of LVAD implantation, 25 million cells, which is a low dose of our cells, is directly injected into the heart through an open heart surgical procedure. The primary endpoint is 90 days looking for the ability to the heart to improve function when you turn off temporarily the mechanical cyst device. 
At 90 days, which is the primary endpoint, none of the treated patients died versus a third of the control, controls. 50% of the treated patients were able to tolerate turning off the heart mechanical heart device compared to only 20% of the controls, and we had a statistically significant improvement in GI bleeding reduction. So on the basis of that, the NIH wanted to sponsor a larger study, 159 patient study, randomized controlled, similar design to the prior earlier study, but now utilizing a higher dose of cells, 150 million cells, which is the same dose that we're using for a different heart failure trial that I'll talk about shortly. This trial uh, now has a six-month primary endpoint, again, looking for the ability for the heart to tolerate turning off the mechanical assist device temporarily. We completed recruitment, and the primary endpoint will read out the end of the first quarter of 2018. Now, shifting to class two and three heart failure, still a progressively uh, progressive disease where these patients are still very sick and at high risk for heart failure, hospitalization, and death. This represents maybe about 40% of all heart failure patients. We initially did a 60-patient randomized controlled study looking at three different doses, 25 million, 75 million, 150 million cells compared to control. This shows uh, at six months uh, an indirect uh, marker, surrogate marker of cardiac function called echo echocardiography, looking at the size of the heart and the ability of the heart to pump. So here it shows systolic and diastolic volume greater than 25 ml reduction in both of these parameters at six months compared to controls. Extremely clinically meaningful. Five to 10 ml reduction is, is pretty impressive, and this is already on top of maximal medical therapy. But these are really just surrogates that are used to predict cardiac function and outcomes uh, and heart failure hospitalizations down the road. Now, if you remember, I said that our cells respond better the sicker the patient. So when we looked at the phase two trial, we saw that about 60% of the patients were really sicker class three heart failure patients where they had systolic volume at baseline greater than 100 ml. So these are big, floppy, dilated hearts. And while we were very impressed before with 27 minus 30 and 3% improvement in injection fraction, when we looked at the sicker subset, we now have doubled that. So again, this indirectly shows that the sicker the patient, the better uh, our ability to improve the outcome is. And these are the exact patients, the sicker patients that we're now enrolling in phase three. But what the FDA cares about, what the payers care about, and what the patients care about is the hard endpoint, heart failure, hospitalization, and cardiac death. So this is a Kaplan-Meier curve uh, looking at survival and heart failure, hospitalization. And over three years, the highest dose, no one died in the treatment group, no one went to the hospital compared to a third of the controls. When you look at the sickest subset, again, none of the treated patients went to the hospital or died, but 71% uh, of the controls had these events. So in phase three, we, the primary endpoint is uh, reoccurring heart failure hospitalizations and takes into account through a joint frailty model, cardiac death, and it's an event-driven trial. So when you reach a certain predetermined number of events, the trial stops. We're also enriched for looking for patients to have had a prior heart failure hospitalization and or elevated nt pro and B. So these patients are further at, at risk for developing these events in a timely manner, and they, hopefully in the control patients, that is. So we anticipate that we need approximately 600 patients to reach the magic number of events, and uh, we've now are more than two-thirds of the way recruited. Uh, we've previously announced that we, after 270 patients, we conducted an interim analysis looking at the primary endpoint, and we successfully passed the futility interim analysis. The data monitoring committee had uh, no concerns or any changes, and we continue to enroll and are looking forward to completing uh, enrollment in the second half of next year. Shifting now to a smaller opportunity, orphan drug designation product called Graphrosos disease. So this is really a complication of bone marrow transplants that are used to treat hematological malignancies. About 30,000 allogeneic bone marrow transplants occur annually. Half of those will develop Graphrosos disease, and half of those will be steroid refractory. So this is a disease when it starts to target the GI and liver, especially in children, has extremely high mortality rate. Only 20 to 30% of children will survive 100 days. So initially, there is a randomized controlled study in children of 28 children, 14 controls, 14 treated. About two-thirds of the treated children were able to demonstrate an overall response that directly correlated with 100-day survival. On the basis of that, the regulators, uh, sorry, the investigators refused to allow children to be randomized to a control arm, and we uh, entertained a expanded access program where we enrolled 241 children. In that setting, uh, over 80% of the children survived 100 days compared to non-responders that were, you know, less than 40%. So the FDA stated that if we saw these type of outcomes, if we did approximately 60 patient large 
open label trial in children and we saw a similar type of results, we'd be able to get uh, accelerated marking approval. Uh, we recently announced uh, some time ago that uh, when approximately 50% of the patients reached uh, the primary endpoint that we successfully also passed the futility interim analysis. This product is also, as I alluded before, already approved and marketed in Japan. So we're extremely optimistic that we're gonna be successful. This trial should read out toward the end of, the end of this year. And uh, we then anticipate if it's approvable that we would expand the label into adults, uh, the sickest subset that has GI and liver complications. Switching now to chronic lower back pain. Uh, this is a, a disease that I think is now in the forefront, especially with the opioid epidemic. Uh, there's, in the US at least, there's greater than 30,000 deaths associated with abuse or misuse of opioids. And 50% of all opioid prescriptions are actually prescribed for chronic lower back pain. Uh, also in the 21st Century Cures Act, besides the Regenerative Medicine Act clauses, there's uh, specific provisions allowing for additional funding and resources to really try to prevent opioid dependence. So again, this, this is why, one of the rationales why we think our chronic lower back pain product will also hopefully be granted RMAT designation. Uh, these are patients who have severe back pain, uh, typically age 45 years around that, that age group. So it's not old patients per se, it's pe people at the prime of their life. Uh, living with back pain for multiple years, failed physical therapy, failed steroid injection. Uh, many of them do not want to get spinal fusion, big orthopedic surgery. So we did a 100-patient randomized controlled phase two study, uh, again, exploring two different doses, 6 million cells and uh, 18 million cells, so a microdose compared to heart failure, uh, compared to control. We gave ourselves a very high bar. We wanted to demonstrate a 50% improvement in pain, a 30% improvement in function, and no, in, no steroidal uh, intervention or spinal fusion surgery. And we wanted to achieve this at multiple time points. So we didn't want to just get lucky and for some reason the patient was feeling good at one time point. They had to demonstrate this composite endpoint at multiple time points. And when you look at this uh, over two years, uh, we show that nearly three times as many treated compared to control patients met this composite endpoint. And uh, we now even have data out three years where 82% of the responders at two years maintained the effect. So a single administration seems to give a durable effect. That's true in heart failure. That's true in, in chronic lower back pain. It's also been true for other diseases that we've been investigating. Uh, on the basis of that phase two trial, we went into phase three, a 360 patient trial. We should complete recruitment of that trial toward the end of this year. Uh, and we have agreement with the FDA what the primary endpoint is. So if we meet it, we, we think uh, this could be a product that could be used to treat these patients. And I think I'll, I'll stop here uh, and allow some questions, but there's clearly a lot of news flow. I think importantly for Mesoblast, uh, the key takeaways are that we're going to have two registrational trial outcomes for both graft host disease and uh, class four heart failure available in the coming months. And I think that will be transformative for our company. And there's uh, plenty of news uh, right behind that. So I'll stop there and uh, answer any questions. Thank you. So we didn't specifically state how many events there were at that time. It was approximately 20% of the overall uh, desired events that were analyzed. So a small number uh, of events, but uh, nevertheless meaningful. So I, I think the interim analysis for the class two and three heart failure suggests directionality suggests that we're having a biological effect. And uh, you know, it, it was as good as an outcome that you could get from that type of analysis. And, and is there a further interest in the No, uh, currently there isn't. Uh, possibly through uh, an RMAT designation, you have the ability to negotiate with the FDA, perhaps a quicker outcome measure of that. But uh, again, I think that, uh, that the timeline for heart failure will be, will have the overall primary endpoint results for the class four heart failure available first quarter of next year. Probably toward the second half of next year, we'll complete enrollment for the class two threes, and sometime in the following year, we'll have the readout for that trial.